Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Okay, so let's see. So I'm trying to set up a few things. Just bear with me a couple more minutes here and I should get started with this session. Um, the first thing I need to do is just make sure that I have all my streaming sessions um, set up. So, you know, we have, we have a YouTube alternative as well, YouTube option. So if you wanna, you know, maybe just uh, get the link for a YouTube uh, stream, you can also do that. But if you really wanna, you know, make the most out of this, these sessions uh, for this study group, I would advise that you try to use the Zoom link as, as the first link, as, as the first option. But, you know, it's always good to have that um, optional um, link as well. And I think it will be really, really convenient for a lot of people that just wanna, maybe just wanna audit the, the sessions. Um, a couple of things before I get started. So I would, I would um, um, appreciate if you leave your audio off, okay? And also your video off for the moment as I go through these couple of slides just to introduce what the, what the study group is about. And, you know, I'll just go through some slides, also introducing a bit of the, also a bit of the content on the first chapter of the book that we're gonna study. And so I really appreciate that. Um, because obviously if you, if you have your audio on and you have your video on, that could create some kind of distraction um, for people here. So I'd appreciate that. And towards the end, of course, we're gonna have like a QA and a and discussion. Um, then you can you know, enable your audio and your video, you're free to do so. And that is something that I would highly, um, highly advise if you wanna you know, participate in the, in the study group. So a lot of people are, are just you know, joining us. Um, I'm really excited about this. This is the first time I do this kind of um, sessions. Most of the sessions that we have been doing in the past, they, for those of you that are new here um, to this community, we have been doing you know, study groups around papers. So we read papers every week or so, and we just dive deep into papers and we discuss them. And we also discuss like the practicality, as practicality aspect of it. I'll get into some examples of other things that we do as well. Um, if you are interested in those, but um, as I wait for others, that's something that um, you should you should know of. I think is is quite important because um, this is obviously the first time we're doing this format, but um, we have been doing this for quite some time now. <clears throat> um, I think since the beginning of the year, we have been doing this, and a lot of people have joined us from all over the world. Um, I try to select a time zone, you know, a time that works for most time zones, but it's really hard to do that. I mean, I'm based in Europe, so. Um, and I have, a, I have a different time zone from most of you, I think. But I think this one was the best one um, that has worked so far for most of our sessions. So hopefully it doesn't, um, most of you can make it in. If you can't, then there's always the recording and we can always use that recording to get a briefing of what happened. Okay, I think we should get started. So I promised I was gonna get started at three, but I tend to wait a little, like maybe five minutes just to give people time to join us. Um, again, there are two streams happening at the same time. So we have the Zoom, which is the actual live stream. And then we have the YouTube live stream as well. It's a little bit delayed, but feel free to use it as well and ask your questions. I'm trying to monitor the chat on YouTube as well for any questions that come up. I'll try to address those, um, but you know, it's gonna be hard for me because I'm the only one trying to monitor both, um, both the, the Zoom group chat and also the group chat on YouTube. So uh, just bear with me if I, if I do take long for some of your questions, okay? All right, let's get started then. So welcome again from you know, where you are joining us. Um, I, I know some of you are coming from all over the world. Some of you are com maybe coming from, the, you know, from, from maybe the US, Canada, or some part in Latin America as well. And I know some of you also from India and Asia, that side of the world as well. And also some of you are joining us from, from uh, Europe as well. So very happy to, to have you here. I hope you learn a lot. That's my intention uh, to teach all that I've, you know, uh, all this knowledge that I've accumulated over the years, um, learning about machine learning, applying it, um, you know, and also being a research scientist as well. So just to give a brief introduction of myself, uh, my name is Elvis. If, if you don't know me, um, so I've, I've been working in the space of NLP for quite some time. I think it was 
from proposal 12 roughly. Um, so back in the days when we used to have like, you know, manually feature engineering kind of models. And those were great. Those were really great times. Um, and I, I kind of was fortunate to see how the community now has transitioned uh, to, to deep learning. And I've seen that transition myself. So, you know, I, I actually have a little bit of, of perspective and kind of also my own opinions about, you know, where this, this field is headed and how you can apply it all these different techniques um, to your problems. So hopefully um, in this study group, we will talk a lot about that. We will talk about hands-on, how to apply deep learning techniques as well, and how to properly apply them. Because those are the discussions we're gonna have. So I'm based sort of, I'm, so I'm based sort of Amsterdam at the moment. So for a while I was living in Taiwan. So Taiwan you know, is, is, is kind of on the Eastern side of the world. So <clears throat> I was there doing my PhD. I did my master's there as well. Um, I was very fortunate to join a really excellent program around information systems and applications. So mostly I was dealing with data, data mining, text mining, and that's how I got introduced to this world of machine learning because I really wanted to apply it and conduct really, um, really great research around that for different problems. So that's where I kind of got introduced to this uh, world of machine learning. And from there, I've been fascinated. I've been writing about machine learning, I've been teaching about machine learning, I've been applying it myself, and I've been doing a lot of uh, this kind of science communication for machine learning. So I'm pretty heavily um, involved in this community. So I'm, I'm really glad that you know, you can, we can come together and talk more about it and how we can apply it correctly as well. So I'm an educator, uh, that's kind of my profession. So currently I'm with the, uh, with the company named Elastic. So it's a company that has and provides uh, real-time search the solutions and many other solutions on top of search. Uh, search is a really huge thing. It's it's uses you know NLP techniques. If you, if you want to look into that as well, uh, there are many things that I also educate people on in terms of um, search. So the information retrieval side of search, because I have some experience with that, uh, and, and and that's something that I do enjoy doing as a profession because I do train people on how to use the technology. And I get to talk about theory. I also get to talk about the practical aspect of search and how to use it for different solutions. So that's a really great experience that I've had over the year. And I really, really um, appreciate that, uh, that the company gave me that opportunity. Um, also, I'm an independent research scientist. Uh, independent means here that I'm not associated with any like university research lab or you know, an, an, a research lab in the industry. Um, I have my own research projects that I you know, conduct um, I'm quite motivated about you know, doing research and conducting research. So what I've done also is part of the Dear DI initiative. I'll talk about it in, in a bit as well, some more. Um, I've you know, started projects. So if you're really interested in getting some, some experience on how to conduct research for machine learning problems and NLP problems, you know, feel free to check, us, uh, check some of our projects, our research projects. Um, you know, it's really beginner friendly. I start with very basic things like data collection and I discuss different ideas that are happening in the space. So, you know, I selected a research project that I know very well and I've decided to go that route because I think it's pretty interesting. And also, uh, you know, since I'm kind of like an expert in that space, I could actually teach uh, a, few, a few things and I'd advise people that are getting started with research. Um, I also founded this community, the AI, I think a year back or so. Um, you know, I didn't, I, I wasn't paying attention when I did it, but it started out as a basically like a, like a meetup group, you know, we got a few people together and we started to talk about this technology, right? Machine learning and NLP. And eventually, you know, there was a lot of people interested in helping me out with different projects. So I really appreciate those people that have helped me out over the past few months. I really appreciate that because that really inspires me to keep going and, and, and have this kind of open, you know, very inclusive community um, to, to spread some education about uh, the space of machine learning. You can always find me on the Twitter. I think most of you have found this because you have seen me on Twitter. I, I kind of, I'm very active there and share things that I found interesting uh, related to deep learning and machine learning. Now, so on the right-hand side, there's some information about the initiative there that the I, this whole study group is, 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 is hosted by this initiative. And, you know, I have a couple of people helping me out later on as well to deliver a couple of lectures and also to help me out with the study sessions here. So pretty excited about that and you know, establishing that collaboration with the community. 
um, you know, just find us on Twitter there. Uh, communicate with us if you have any any intention or you have some ideas and some talks that you want to deliver, or maybe you can help us out as well with the initiative. I really appreciate that. Um, and then the Slack group there is always very important. And that's where most of the communication happens. People are asking questions. They get a lot of help there. So feel free to join us there and, and, and communicate with us. Just ask us questions. There's a lot of like practitioners there, people in industry. There's a lot of researchers, people that are beginning as well. And they ask questions and we kind of engage there. And it's very, very open community and very helpful as well. Uh, the GitHub link right there, it's, I'm going to share the slides later as well in our GitHub repo for this study session, for this study group. And you will get access to all the slides. So you know, later on, I'll provide those as well. So the agenda for today is just going to introduce a little bit about the study group. Uh, for those of you that couldn't join, like there was kind of like a first session, like orientation kind of session, where I kind of introduced what this was going to be about. But I'll just briefly touch on some of the points that I discussed there, at least important ones, and how we are going to move forward with the study group. This is going to be an introduction to deep learning. So we're not going to really jump into specifics yet. We're not going to do any coding. We're not going to do a coding walkthrough. But I think this is really, really um, important session because it's going to you know, show you some of the concepts that are coming up, right? It's going to give you a good sense or a structure um, to, to kind of guide yourself on the things that you need to learn and the things that you should expect coming in the future for the study group. Um, so we're going to have a Q&A, very short Q&A as well. So I'll go through some slides here and then I'm going to open the, I'm going to open for a discussion and you can ask your questions. Uh, you know, people can chime in as well, you know, talk about their experience. And, and I really want this to be about you. I want it to be an open forum. I want it to be something that you feel comfortable and you feel included. Right of the as part of the study group, it's not your typical study group, I would say, and I've said this, this before, um, where you know I'm talking, I'm talking, and I'm responding all the questions. I don't want it to be that way because there's so many other people doing that already. I want this to be something that you are comfortable with, and you get involved, and you have all those exercises that you participate in, and you answer questions, and you help out people. So this is the way you learn, right? So the hands-on experience is really fundamental and very important here. And that's why I decided to spend some time and do this kind of study group. It's an idea I've had for quite some time, you know, and I received permissions from the authors of this book to actually do this kind of um, study group. So that's what that was very important for me and really motivating for me. And that's why I wanted to do it. So feel free to, you know, ask your questions. Feel free to also answer some of those questions from those people that are asking as well. And, and just engage, right? Engage with the, with the people that are here because that's the way you're going to learn, you know, at least the direction where machine learning is headed, you'll realize that working with communities is going to become even more important than it is today. So what is the study group about? So as I said, not your conventional study group. I would have slides. So I'm going to you know, prepare a couple of slides just to capture the main points out of each chapter. That's something that I would do. I spend some time on that. I don't mind doing it because eventually what I will do in the future is basically pitch this as a course. It's going to be an open course. I'm also working in another course for NLP as well, just designed for NLP. And that's something that's coming in the future as well. But I wanted to create slides, you know, just to have those available for people and make those accessible for people as well that couldn't join us live. And, you know, just to capture the main points out of each chapter in those in, in, the, in the book. So it is a study group to encourage open discussion and participation, as I said, right? So participate, this is, where, this is how you're gonna learn. I have many different like initiatives, different projects that I run with the Dear the AI initiative. And one thing I always say when I start every session, you know, feel, feel comfortable, try to aim to feel comfortable to have a discussion with someone, even if it's just a one-to-one -one discussion, um, you know, this is, this is the way you're gonna basically experiment with the things that you're learning you know so if you have something that you don't know when you feel like it's a very basic question and you don't want to ask it because you are afraid of sounding too stupid or something like that that's never the case with us we always encourage you to ask your questions even if it's simple and there's no stupid question here and we're going to take our time and you know get you involved so who is it for so anyone who is interested in machine learning, basically, and deep learning principles. So you're going to learn some principles. That's what the book is about. It's a really good, I think, stepping stone to learn all these concepts, uh, you know, written in the book and discussed in the book. And I really like the approach the book takes because it's more like, hey, we have all these different principles and concepts. You know, once you kind of master them and you practice them, you are able to go, you know, to 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 your 
you know, to your job, whatever job or role you have, and you can apply it. So it's a skill you learn. You don't have to be a machine learning expert. You don't have to be a researcher. It's just, it's, it's just another, you know, it's just another tool in your tool kit. And just think of it that way. And you definitely will learn a lot in the, in the study sessions. So what will you get out of it? It's again, it's just about deep learning principles. There's going to be a lot of hands-on experience. Um, I'm going to, you know, make my best effort to include exercises that I have found really helpful in, in, in my journey. I'm learning about machine learning. I'm still obviously just learning a lot, learning a lot, and I'm learning a new techniques because every time we have new techniques every day, we have new techniques to solve different um, different components of uh, machine learning pipeline. So I'm always learning, you're right. So there's always a room to learn as well. But the hands-on experience has been really key here. So things to know. So this is gonna be the D2L.ai online book. So you can take a look at that website. It's, a, it's an open book, you know, it's constantly updated. I like it. They have solutions for different languages as well. And that's really what pushed me to start this study group. Because, you know, one thing for me is I don't want to be too religious about the language. But you know, I, if there's a language that I feel comfortable with teaching, um, and that's available, you know, with this particular book, that's that's what I thought. It was a good idea to uh, move forward with this, and I'll feel more comfortable using something like PyTorch rather than you know something like TensorFlow. I, although I've used TensorFlow before, and I'm pretty sure I could actually spin up a couple collab notebooks and transfer Python code to TensorFlow myself. Uh, but you know, I feel very confident about PyTorch, and most of our code watchers will be related to PyTorch. But if you have any questions around that, you feel free to leave them towards the end, and I'll take those questions and I'll try to answer and provide you more specifics about that. So the online book has roughly over 17 chapters. Uh, we're going to do like 17 sessions. These are going to be done biweekly. So what do I mean by biweekly? So one thing I also want to put across, and I mentioned this before as well, is that again, it's not your conventional study group or course, right? It's just a program to get you involved and, and to give you that time to participate. Because if you want to cram this information, there are many places that you can go to actually cram that information if you like. Uh, but I've heard from people that have had really bad experiences with taking courses and at the end, they just, they just didn't learn anything. And they just cram all this information in, in like two or three months and they just couldn't learn anything. So I want to take my time. I want to provide you exercises that you know will help you develop your skills. And I don't want to like rush it. I'm, I'm always going to be here, you know, for as long as I'm here. Um, I will always take my time to provide you like great reading materials. Um, it's something that I'm really passionate about, and, and to give you access, uh, to give you links that are accessible and references that have helped me in the past. And I will do that sharing. I, I don't mind doing it because. Obviously for me, it's, it's something I'm really passionate about sharing stuff like this. So it's gonna be done bi-weekly. That's kind of the schedule for now, the tentative schedule. So, you know, two weeks after we're gonna start with you know, chapter two, that's kind of the plan. If something happens in between, I will make that announcement um, on our Slack group and also on the GitHub repo, that schedule will be maintained. Um, there are going to be live discussions, code walkthroughs. People have asked for code walkthroughs since the day I started this initiative. I haven't had the time to actually do code walkthroughs, but I share a lot of code. I do share a lot of code and examples, and, and I have all this code there, but I've never found the time and you know the the, the reason to use it. This is a time I think for me to you know do code walkthroughs and and just share all this knowledge that I've accumulated over 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 the years. And we'll have like quick overviews as well. So quick overviews will be like these slides and we're gonna have that live discussion as well. Yeah, so a great question, right? So the one question in the, in the chat was, so the entire course will last, you know, 17 times two weeks, that's a long time. Again, maybe in between, like I said before, in between we will have lectures, special lectures. It, it does sound like a long time. It does sound like it's gonna take even two semesters, something like that. But that's the, that's the strategy I'm going to use here. If that doesn't work for you, um, just come to the sessions that you're mostly interested in. That would be totally fine. Um, but I think doing it this way will give, you know, will, will give me the time, because I do also manage other projects as well, will give me the time to prepare well for the sessions and to you know, provide you the material and exercises to help build up your skills. I always say that you have different ways to actually learn about deep learning. There are so many courses online. There are so many books. Those are places you can actually go in the meantime and just learn. And, you know, you always have to keep learning something. So I, you know, strongly recommend you to do that. 
um, if you think that this is going or moving too slowly. But believe me, I could guarantee you something like at the end of maybe eight sessions that we do, right? I, I could guarantee you that um, this will be a different experience for you because I've designed this really differently from what I've seen and, and, and information I've collected over the, over the years about those MOOCs and those courses that are available online and all that content that is online. Um, and that's the why I, I, I decided to design it this way. So for beginners for, for NLP, so if, if you are a beginner, that's totally fine. That's, this is the re reason I formatted like this, to be very beginner friendly. But at the same time, even if you have experience with deep learning, there's always gonna be something for you to learn here uh, because I'm gonna provide you a lot of reading material, a lot of papers that I found interesting as well to keep up with research. And also um, the codes, walkthroughs will also not only involve code from the book, but also code that I've designed myself. So yeah, it's not gonna, it's, it is beginner friendly and we will have NLP as well. We, we will have section on NLP. So questions are really coming in quick. What I'll do is just go back to those questions later on because I, I need to go through the slides and I'll take those questions in the QA section. Um, there's a certificate of completion, which means if you complete more than 80% of the exercises that, that I hand out, um, you know, I've provided all the steps for, for you know, participating in this. It, you don't have to do it, right? You can just audit the sessions as well and be involved. That's totally fine if you wanna do that. But the certificate of completion is just to push people to basically go and you know, practice this stuff. Um, I could be talking here about deep learning for days, but you know, I think the, the, the right way to learn this is to actually get that hands-on experience as well. So just to push people, I wanted to offer a certificate of completion um, for those of you that are interested. So more info in the GitHub repo, I will always use that as the canonical source. So you can always go there and find the latest information about the study sessions. And some prerequisites. Now, this is what you typically see with most courses around deep learning. This, by the way, hasn't been standardized and, and that's unfortunate, but um, we're working on this and I'll be working on this. That's why I've kind of created this, this all this time for myself to collect information that I think is useful um, and, and, and just pick up references that I know will work um, for some of you. So linear algebra calculus, that's the basics that you, any, any, any course that you can go over, you know, basic course that you can go over. There's so many online that you can go and try to get familiar. You don't have to get familiar with everything. Actually, when we start to talk about some, some math parts and also the probability and statistics, I would actually select some chop, chapters and some open books that I found online that have helped me um, kind of uh, get an idea of some concepts and I will share those with you. Uh, so you don't really need to go and read a book. There are some places where you can actually practice um, um, a few things just to get an idea of the concepts that are mostly important in deep learning. And yeah, that was a good suggestion, by the way. I was just gonna mention that. So Jing actually mentioned Khan Academy. That's a really good place. Actually, when I started to learn about machine learning, um, you know, I had, a, I had a good math background, but I haven't, like, there was some time that I actually took a break from, from, from you know, it, it, my journey in school. So um, took a couple of years break. And when I wanted to get back, I just couldn't find a good resource. And I went to Khan Academy and, it has been the best experience to actually cover all that math that I really need. And they're really, really specific about math. And there's so many different things that you can learn there um, and some concepts you can learn by example. So really like that. I strongly suggest that one, I uh, recommend that one. So that's about the statistics there. All of statistics is just an open book that you can download. I think it's from Springer, uh, but don't go there yet because obviously I don't want you to be discouraged. I'm gonna select the chapters and, and, and the parts that I uh, that I recommend later on. So I'll provide that in the GitHub repo as well. So also you can see in the chat, take a, take a note of that people are sharing, which is, this is the thing that I love about communities. So people are sharing, you know, what have worked for them. And I'm actually gonna take notes of those as myself as well. So there are like playlists, there are all of these different things that you can look at, Stanford Linear Algebra, there's a good course on that. So all these different things, right? So you don't, don't feel overwhelmed because there's a lot of content there. What I will do is just um, prepare a couple of reading materials for you. It's not gonna be a lot of material, but material that will get you prepared for the, for the upcoming um, um, sessions. And then Python programming. So what have worked for me is Code Academy. Code, I'm a big fan of Code Academy. I, I know some courses are very basic, but they have been really working hard over the years to create really you know, advanced courses. So when I go, like I think a month ago, I actually took um, one of the advanced Python courses and I was really, really surprised of the quality of the course. So, you know, if you, if you have time, you know, check that out as well. 
um, it's really worth your time. If you are not familiar or not friendly with Python, this is the language that we will use. Take a look at that. There's also free resources like Learn Python that's actually recommended in the book that you can go and take a look as well and start to do that, right? You don't have to wait because if you're not familiar with this programming language, um, it will be really difficult for you. I hope that the code walkthroughs can simplify things and you know I can explain some concepts and you can ask me questions and I can help you out. But, and obviously in the group, people can help you out as well. But it, this is, has to be your initiative. You have to go and learn it yourself. And there are many places you can go and get started. It's never too late. Go, go ahead and, and, and learn some Python. You will be, definitely find it useful here. Data mining and text mining. So in the past, like I said, I've, I actually started with data mining and text mining. Most of the concepts that actually are introduced in deep learning for some reason were introduced in this course, like data mining and text mining. Um, and, and the concepts keep coming back, like dimensionality reduction, all these different techniques, right? Um, HMMs, all different techniques that you hear about that people use nowadays. These things have, are discussed in these basic courses. So I think this was a great way to get introduced into the world of machine learning, because it's mostly focused on data, mine, data processing, you know, creating features manually and all these things and, and understanding some kind of like math behind some models like SVMs. The other stuff is taught in those courses. If you get a chance to take a look at any of those courses, those are basic courses. They're really meant for people that are getting started with, 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 uh, with data science fields. So if you find anything, just go ahead and, 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 and try to cover some of that material there. Um, I would also recommend a few books as well for those of you that are getting started. So that, that's something I'm gonna provide later on. Um, okay, so so this one is more talking about people that are, you know, want to get involved with the exercises and they want to push themselves, right? So there's always Google Collab there. You have access to a free GPU. Most people use that these days. And, you know, when, 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 you, when I ask for submission of code, uh, I would generally want to ask for a Collab notebook or a GitHub notebook, if you can actually save it on your GitHub. I encourage you to use GitHub for, for some reason. I've been doing this from from you know, the day I started to learn about machine learning. I always share my notebooks. Um, I think this has helped me a lot to build up a, a portfolio for myself. And I really strongly suggest you to do so. Um, it really helps people, you know, you never know when someone finds your code and find it useful and they can you know, adopt your code and use it. So it's, it's always good to share stuff that you learn. Okay, so there are, of course, other places like Kaggle as well that you can share. So, you know, feel free to, to use those as well. Um, when I do ask for the, the, the link to assignment, and this is just for people that are wanting to get involved with the completion, the certificate of completion, you can provide me a link to basically a PDF if you want. Yeah, because I'm just gonna go over the code and, and check um, for correctness. And I will give you some feedback if I see something that could be improved. Um, but there's no like failure, there's no like pass or fail or anything like that. It's just, it's just a completion status, right? It's just, yes, you completed or no, you haven't completed. Because if you send me two lines of code and this one required, you know, an actual model, then basically that's incomplete. So just it, this is, is something that I will um, that I will try to do my best to provide you some feedback and how to improve, right? So if I see something that could be improved, I will I will let you know. Um, but there's no fail or pass; it's just incomplete um, or, or or complete, and that will be that's the kind of the system we will use here. And if you can finish more than eighty percent of it. Um, um, you definitely qualify for the certificate of completion. So other important information here, sessions are being recorded. So just know that, right, that these sessions are being recorded. I will put them online. I'll make, I'll make them publicly available because unfortunately not everyone can join us live. So other people want access to this information. They'll be joining us from other places in the world. Um, and probably there's a really bad time for them. Um, so, you know, I, I want to make sure this thing is accessible because we won't do this every day. I mean, we will, we will try to provide that information for them. And, and I'm most willing to share everything that I, that I teach. So hopefully that's okay with you. So use the official discussion forum for any questions. So official discussion forum, that's part of the, the D2L, that the iBook, uh, Dive into Deep Learning book. So there's the own, their, their own discussion forum. I wanted to establish a discussion forum for the study group, but I think it doesn't make sense because there's a lot of questions that you may ask that are already asked in the discussion forum that they have. So go there and, and try to ask questions. Is there anything that you know we couldn't answer here? Go there. Um, I see that they're pretty active, like the people that wrote the book, they're pretty active there and they're constantly asking questions. So anything that puzzles you, any confusion about anything that we couldn't answer here, um, you can always go ahead and, and try that one. I will also be very active there because um, one thing that I'm going to do with this whole study sessions, um, I'm going to provide the authors some, you know, I promise them they're going to provide them some feedback uh, about 
what I've learned from, from, from the book and how, which ways to improve the book, which ways to improve different uh, materials that they have available on their website. So please take a look at assignment one is here. I'll just click on the link. It's gonna be due one week from today. A lot of questions around this, one week from today, which means you know, in seven days, this, this, th that will be the deadline for this assignment. It's a basic assignment. I'm, I'm not gonna, I know some of you are working, some of you are in school. I know that I'm very aware of that, right? And, and you know, I'm not gonna you know, force you to do this again. As I said, it's up to you if you wanna do it, but know that I'll be checking those and I'm gonna provide you some feedback and I'm gonna spend on, some time on that. Um, just to help you out with that as well. Code of conduct, take a look at that as well. You know, we are, we are you know, so many different like backgrounds, right? And we know different backgrounds, which implies that, you know, we have our own culture and this and, and, and this and that. But I think ideally what I want is, you know, just to have really normal behavior, good behavior, let's respect each other and let's not use like vocal la language against each other and just, just respect each other, right? So we don't really need to go um, and cross the line here. Um, and, and I really strongly um, encourage you to do so and check, take a look at that code of conduct. It's kind of generic, but you know, it gives you an idea and, on the things that uh, we should avoid when interacting with people. <clears throat> so this is a content structure, introduction, preliminaries, linear. Uh, so linear neural networks is gonna start very basic uh, idea of you know, neural networks. And then it's gonna be multi-layer perceptions, right? So we, we create more deeper layers with deep learning computation. And so we have all this kind of really neat. I really like this chart because it kind of encompasses um, what, what exactly you're going to learn in, in this particular uh, program. So, you know, introduction, preliminaries, linear neural networks, multi-layer perceptions. Then you have like these side things that are popping up, right, from, from multi-layer perceptions. So when you talk about, uh, you know, multiple layers, you're talking about optimization algorithms, and we'll discuss some of those as well, the latest ones as well. And when you talk about optimization algorithms, then you start to talk about performance, right? So some algorithms, they take longer than others, right? To optimize um, your models. So it's always a discussion, a good discussion to have. Um, so if you look at the middle, there's like the deep learning computation, and then there's recurrent neural networks, modern RNNs, and that eventually leads to like sequential models, right? Sequential models, NLP. So different problems related to NLP will be discussed and we will do a lot of coding walkthroughs there. And I will also share some of my experience there as well. Um, convolutional neural networks, that's the other one on the left. Uh, so these ones are used mostly and really heavily in computer vision, right? So you see modern CNNs and modern approaches as well. And then obviously to the right, you see the attention mechanisms, which basically has taken over uh, the world of deep learning. Attention mechanisms really, really are powerful uh, ways to you know, obtain really rich representations from your data and, and being able to, to um, build predictive models um, for many different kind of tasks. So that's, that's, that's gonna be a really interesting discussion to have as well. Um, so the, the, the world of transformers, that's is taking over everything. So let's do a, a quick introduction here to deep learning. Um, so, so neural networks, right, were at some point, and now I'm touching on the concepts actually discussed in the book. So at some point, you know, we had like neural networks for a long time, we have had neural networks and there's so many people that were involved in neural networks. Uh, but you know, these, these at some point were considered unmoded tools. So other machine learning techniques were used. So like your classical machine learning models, SVMs, na naive Bayesian, all these different methods were actually uh, more popular at some point because obviously neural networks uh, didn't really work well because there wasn't enough data. And also, of course, we didn't have the right, uh, the right devices or the right uh, hardware to, do, to, to make use out of these methods. So eventually, of course, everything caught up. We had you know, um, cheaper computation, uh, bigger, datas, bigger data sets accessible. And so um, now you was, you're, what you're seeing now is like this deep learning um, is driving rapid progress um, and neural networks is basically what's powering deep learning um, techniques. So all of these ones on the right um, are the ones that th th those things will come back here. We're gonna put we'll just like a chapter for each one of these um, themes like computer vision, NLP, reinforcement learning, statistical modeling, and also, and also speech recognition. So there's a lot of content around that as well that's coming up. So very brief slides. These are the things that were covered in the in the book. And I'm just at a high level introducing these concepts. Um, again, in the first chapter, there's not a lot of like substantial stuff. It's just like more history 
and what has happened and where we are at at this point. So just, just bear with me until I reach to the end of the slide. And if you have any questions around that, I'll take those and we can have a, 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 like a short discussion about it. Um, so recent advancements using deep learning. So we have seen a lot of advancement, a lot of news coming out that you know we're solving all different types of problems. So you know, recently we saw like, for instance, um, a lot of like an explosion of different like creative applications around things like the GPT-3, right? It's powered by transformers. So you also had a couple of years back, like DeepMind developing this kind of intelligent agent to play Go, right? So in, in an intelligent way, in an automated way, and that could have you know, that actually beat the world champion in Go. So those things, you know, those are the things that we consider as advancements in deep learning. And there's so many, right? When you talk about all the possibilities of how you can use deep learning and where you can apply it, there's so many things that come up, right? Self-driving cars, um, you know, drafting email assistants, these are things that we use today. That is how ubiquitous deep learning is becoming, how important it's becoming. It's, it's actually a skill that developers you know, should have at this point because it's gonna become so fundamental for, for building applications and, in, and, and building those interactive technologies. So smart reply as well, movie making, diagnosing of diseases like cancer, physical simulators as well. You know, in astrophysics, um, you work with data in such a high dimension and of course, you know, neural networks are really great at compressing information and retaining information, valuable information. So it has a really good application there. And DNA sequencing as well, right, in biology. So a very different ways how to apply um, deep learning. And these are some of the recent advancements. So why machine learning? Um, so, you know, I showed you the recent advancements, but, you know, it wasn't, it, it, it's like, so when you're solving a problem and you have like a, tool that you want to build or an application that you want to build, you always start with first principles. This is something that you learn you know, at school. This is something that you learn when you first go to the first day in your job. You're going to learn that there's always like this you know, recipe that you need to follow, first principles, these are the rules. And you know, some, those are really good to follow. You always start with those, right? So you kind of design your business logic for your application. And no, you, you, you kind of just blow it out, right? So you have all this kind of framework that you want to develop, right? You have all the actions of all the possible scenarios. And, and this happens before you even put a product out, right? Before you put it out there for users to, to use it. So this is how you basically design applications. You, you're not even thinking about intelligent systems. You're not thinking about machine learning yet. Right? So that's your typical thing, uh, way of developing an application. Um, of course, you, you are going to ask your question now because it's so popular now, machine learning, I want some intelligence in an application, maybe I want to automate something in my application and I think I could use uh, machine learning. So, you know, how do you decide whether you can use machine learning or whether it's useful, right? And or whether it doesn't make any sense. That's a very important question. And actually that's a discussion um, that, that was presented in the first chapter of this book, which I really like because that's very important. I mean, why are you wasting your time learning about machine learning when probably you won't use it? If you are gonna use it, uh, which is most of the case today, well, have a reason to use it. Don't just use it because it's there and accessible. You must have a reason why. So when do you need it? That's the question. So you can solve, uh, you can solve different problems. So you know, if you have a problem that requires some adaptation in the program, so you think of rules, right? So you design rules, and you know, somehow your application is able to meet all the transactions that a user uh, is performing on your application. But there's no need to adapt the program. There's no need to automate anything because all the rules that you have established actually work, right? All the workflows, they do work. Um, and you can handle you know, edge cases, you can handle any normal case, you can handle all different kinds of cases. But at some point, you maybe need to adapt your program and you maybe need to automate something because the the amount of possibilities is just endless, right? So that's where you would, you know, use machine learning. So machine learning is, again, is just to learn from experience and improve performance on a task using observational data. So, you know, it's, it's something, it's an algorithm that learns from experience, learns from the data that you provided, and it tries to perform a particular task. And how does this happen? We're going to discuss that shortly. But that's the idea. And I think that discussion, if you, if you haven't seen the chapter, take a look at the discussion. There's so many examples that are provided there of why, when not to use machine learning and you know, when to actually use it. So take a look at it. It's really, really, really helpful. 
So here's just a quote, machine learning is a study of powerful techniques that can learn from experience, right? That's what they are, simply what that's what they are. I know a lot of people are like anthropomorphizing machine learning or like AI agents are gonna take over the world. No, it's just a technique to learn from data, learn from experience and be good at one particular task, the task that you train that model uh, to be good at. So some motivating example here. So we have like series of the world, okay, those are like, um, I don't know about okay Google, but I know Alexa. So you know, you you say a word, it triggers something based on that word. That word is basically like command, and it's just gonna trigger um, the, the device. So it's kind of like like a wake word model uh, that you need to design to actually wake up the device, and then the device is kind of responsive. It interacts with you. So that's a basic application. Some motivating example here. And why is this useful? So how is this related to what I was discussing here in terms of adapting the program? So let's say you want to design rules to uh, build a wake word model. So you can actually you know, create your rules, but as you expand the use cases, as you understand that you know, your customers and your users are from all over the world, and you know, some users, they use different languages, they use different tones, everything varies. So the, there's an endless possibility here um, uh, of ways that the, the users are interacting with this, with this particular application. So in this case, maybe it makes sense to have a machine learning model that actually can automate uh, some part of the application and help you to uh, solve a particular task. In this case, the task was um, the wake word to activate the device. And in this case, obviously, this is more like speech recognition, right? So the amplitude of sound waves are the features to basically predict whether it should wake or not, whether it should be activated or not. Um, so the question you may ask yourself is, can you build this from first principle? Like I said, you may be able to come up with like a list, but do you know all the languages? Do you have, I mean, do you, we don't even have tools to process data, to transform data into you know, a particular language, right? So that's something that's limited in our field. And, you know, we're working hard to ensure that uh, we can support as many languages as we could. And that's going to be a discussion that we're going to have a lot here because I work in that space and I really like to talk about it, like low resource languages and what we can do about that. Um, so what makes this a hard problem? Again, the number of, of possibilities here um, and, and how that input data uh, can, be, can be introduced into the model. And definitely I think for this one, a machine learning would help obviously because um, you need a program that can kind of adapt to different situations. Okay, so other motivating examples. Um, this is obviously not your classical, uh, yeah, but this one will be the classical one. This may be not so classical, but I really like the example because, you know, when you think about it, like people that are using these devices, they can come from anywhere in the world and it, it will always vary. There's so much variance here in that input. So that's the reason why it's a good example. But then you have the classical examples, like you can actually build a detector that emits large value or you know, a large negative or positive value. And that will determine whether it's gonna uh, whether the model decides whether it's a cat or dog or something like that, if these are pictures um, and so forth. So a real-time transcriber as well. So you know, we have, we have used like, um, uh, like speech recognition to develop transcribers. Those are very common these days and those are constantly being improved. Uh, translator of languages, right? Machine translation. So this is the example here at the bottom. Who are you? Como estas? So the model translates that and what does it, what's the model look like? Those things will be discussed as we proceed in, the, in, in this, this, this study group. So in later sessions, when we touch about NLP concepts, we will discuss what are the methods that are used for machine translation. So just more motivating examples. These are your like, classical examples in those different um, spaces. So training process, what does this look like? I really like the chart, very simplified. Actually, there's a lot of steps missing here, but this is not the high level. This is what the training process look like. So you design a model, you grab that new data, you update the model. How is this update? What's happening under the update? That's something we would discuss later on, but you know, that model is updating itself and it checks if it's good enough based on some criteria. And then, you know, if at some point you need more data, you grab the data and you keep updating the model. So that's kind of how machine learning is used at a high level. But obviously all of this we will discuss in greater detail as we jump into the different chapters in the book. So from shallow models to deep models. So we, we, we have this idea of machine learning, what it is, learning from experience, algorithms that you build to learn from experience, learn from the data that you provided. I know, but they're quite limited and constrained. 
because obviously with the classical machine learning, you would need, well, when you're using these methods like SVM and these other methods, you would need to engineer features, right? You manually engineer features. Those are really good days, by the way. <laughs> so uh, I remember those days when you had to engineer features, you had to, you have to have some domain expertise. You really need to know, but that's actually wasn't, was a good thing to me, I think, in my, in my opinion, it was a good thing because um, as a student, when I wanted to kind of master something, I wanted to be an expert in something and, you know, engineering features was a lot of fun and I could always develop a model and improve a model based on some features that I learned. And I really felt like I was part of the process of training this model. But nowadays, all of this is being, you know, this is gone. Like we are now using deep learning um, models. Deep learning models, they just learn automatically, learn features automatically, right? So if you have a computer vision model, you, you feed it pictures or you have some kind of like, uh, NLP model as well. Uh, you feed it sequences and it just learns features, learn the hierarchy in the, in, the, in the data and learn representations, rich representations that could be used for you know, uh, just a variety of tasks. And all of this is learned automatically. So the great thing with deep learning, which I, I think this is just makes a lot of sense. Like you're not throwing away any data. You don't need to throw away anything, right? So with the manually engineer features, you kind of, you know, you select features, but then you you kind of lose a lot of information. Maybe that information was useful. Uh, maybe you didn't know that that you you could have developed another new feature. Um, so you only test, you test, you test, and it takes a lot of time. It's very iterative in nature. Uh, but with deep learning, it's just like it's just fast tracking this process and 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 learning features automatically. So it's very very powerful. And deep learning provides this kind of unified set of tools for various different problems. Like I said. Um, right, it's very, it's very generalizable. It's, you can apply it in to all different kinds of problems, as you see in computer vision and NLP, and even speech recognition is applied all over the place. Um, so yeah, that's that's a note on deeper models. So what's the key concepts here? So regarding any ML problem, and now we will start start to talk about you know what's what what are the main components of a machine learning you know model or problem. So here we have data, of course, right? Then we have model, then we have loss, and we have algorithm. What is this about? So first we need a data set, right? And then we you know, design a model on top of that data, right? So think of these as just like, you know, like pieces, like in a puzzle, right? So you have data, model, then you have loss and algorithm. This is why I think deep learning is really powerful because you can actually have these different things, these different components, and you know you create toolkits like deep learning toolkits. You know, that's why these are really popular these days, like PyTorch and TensorFlow, because basically someone can say, well, I you know came up with a better loss function or a better model, a better optimization algorithm, and they just you know uh, put in code there, implement the code for a particular paper that came out. That's that's you know a better optimization algorithm. So this is why it's 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 very modular in nature. So that's why we have been we have seen that this rapid progress because people are just focusing on the different components and just improving the components. And it's just getting better every single day. So data, right? And then you design your models. Um, the loss is basically just, it's just a measure of how uh, the, badness, the badness of this model, right? How good it's doing at the task. And then you have this algorithm that's using the loss and in, that's trying to uh, kind of update the model, right? Now we'll talk about what it's updating, the parameters of the model. Um, so that it minimizes the loss, right? Minimizes the loss so that we can improve this model on the task that we're training it on. So what kind of data? So at the high level, these are some, these are just some like really nice pictures that show you, you know, data at the end of the day, right? Can come in different forms, depending on the domain that you're working with. So you can have a domain like uh, images, you can have a domain like, you know, text, you can have, uh, you know, audio snippets or something like that. Um, but you really, at the end of the day, need to represent this numerically, right? And when you represent this numerically, you ask yourself, well, how do I transform it? Right? What tools do I use to transform it? What techniques do I use to transform this data uh, correctly? So these are the things that we're going to learn in this, in this, in this, these like sessions for the study group. So these are uh, heavily, heavily will be discussed, um, and, and some kind of best practices for transforming your data. And so, you know, and things to avoid as well. So how to standardize your inputs, all these different things that are uh, very convenient for training faster models. So all these things will be discussed. So this is just like some examples, right? You have the like images, maybe RGB, and then they could be represented to like sort of a matrix or something like that. And then you have a sequence that could be represented in like, like a vector, like a word embedding or something like that. 
Then you have uh, audio snippets, maybe using MFCC. I'm just showing concepts here, but all of these things will be discussed again later on. Um, you know, represent kind of like what the uh, uh, the intensity um, of, of of certain uh, a certain point in time was the intensity, was the energy um, um, intensity of, of of the of the audio snippet. So those are really interesting to learn about as well. All of these will be covered later on. So challenges with the data. So what's the challenges? I really like this slide. It takes, I took some time because um, I really want to emphasize on you know, what makes data processing. Data processing is basically the hardest part of when you're trading models. Models are really good, right? They, like I said, very generalizable. You can apply them to different problems, but essentially you need to spend time on your data, reprocessing it right. And there's so many different challenges that come with data sets. Um, well, of course, depending on what domain you're working on, but but you'll always see these problems come out, like fixed length, right? So um, it, it is so it's, it is kind of convenient to have this property in your data, but you know it's always not present there. So if you're working with text, for instance, it's always going to be you know a varying length. If you look at Amazon reviews, they're never the same length, right? It's always going to vary in length. So what do you do, um, and how do you actually standardize your data, um, and how do you represent your data as you feed it into a model? How do you do that? Those are the things that we will end up discussing a lot. Um, in the study group. Um, and then standardization is really key. Standardization, how do you standardize your data? So for images, you may need to crop them, you need, you need to do all types of transformations. And how do we use tools like PyTorch to actually do that transformation of the data and ensure that those transformations are what you're actually implementing as well? That's very key here. Um, so bearing length, like you see, is very important um, message here. That's what kind of makes it really challenging to deal with data. But there are other aspects as well, right? So data could actually unrepresent. So you know, that could unrepresent a group of people as well. So what do we do in that case, right? What do we do with this data? Maybe that data is not representative of what you think it should represent. How do we actually fix that problem? How do we fix problems like with, with bias in data, right? So these are things that are really important to have that discussion. And you know, we we'll definitely have discussions around that as well as we proceed. Um, so, you know, data can also reflect societal pre prejudices, as I said, right? So like if you feed, for instance, we saw in the news lately, like um, there was some problem with, I think, I think it was a university or something like that, or a college that, you know, was using a machine learning model to basically like, uh, I think it was for grading. So it was grading some kind of tests or exams, uh, but it was, it was actually trained on data from another college. So it, it is really crazy. Like these things are actually happening, but you know, these are best practices that we, these are things that we can avoid. We can avoid these things if we know how to apply these things correctly. Um, and it's such a shame that it's happening. But again, this is the reason why we form these study groups to inform people that these are things you should pay attention as you apply these in your applications. So check out that news bit. You should definitely check it out. Uh, there's a lot to learn there uh, on things to avoid. So models like uh, the machine learning models, as I said, I won't go through too much here, but this is just saying that with deep learning, right? The, 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 ma the main difference was that uh, you apply mini transformations, right? So you have all these deep layers. And of course the layers are just applying certain transformations to the data. And then you apply some kind of other types of transformations on the day you, you keep that in layer, right? In a, in a layered way. Um, and at the end, what you what you end up with is something that you know has so much so much um, properties stored about what your data um, represents. So, <clears throat> and that's what's used at the end of the day. This is what your aim is, and 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 you know you you can use, for instance, transfer learning for this. Like that's another topic that we're going to discuss. So once you have all this represent rich representation, you can transfer it to different domains, right, and different problems. So how do you do that? How do you actually make use of, of neural networks? Uh, it's quite a, a very important conversation that we will have. Um, I, I did spoke about um, objective functions, right? Objective functions is your last function. You maybe have heard about this, maybe not, but the last function is just another component of your model. So the last function tells it, you know, how good is this? How bad it is? How good the model is doing? Um, and that's very important, right? Actually, I've heard from many lot of a lot of experts that this could potentially be like kind of the most important part of machine learning, loss function. If you don't have a loss function, how do you measure how good a model is doing? So we always have like these researchers and experts that are developing better and better loss functions for different problems. Um, it's a very, very important part of machine learning and it's really important to understand it 
because of course with every task and every problem it, it could be the case that you know you can improve your last function it can be the case that you could use a last function that has been developed already um, but yeah it's, it's really important part of machine learning <clears throat> and of course the last function is again it, it measures the, how good and, or bad the model is doing at a particular task and you know it's 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 going to use uh, it's going to basically you're going to have this kind of uh, algorithm that you're going to use um, to optimize your parameters of the model so that eventually you minimize this loss. So you want to minimize um, the errors of the model. <clears throat> and typically lower is better. Um, and this is very important because this is how you know, right, how well this model is doing, as I said, but it also tells you like the training error and test error. And it's really good to check how generalizable the model is, how it's generalizing to your problem and whether there's an overfitting problem. Overfitting, uh, again, a very important discussion. And the only way you can check for overfitting is by actually having a proper last function. So get very, very important part of machine learning. And we are gonna have uh, a blast learning about last functions. I can guarantee you that. Um, uh, optimization algorithms is so, that's what's used, right? To like fine tune the model and change some parameters and those parameters is key to actually come up with better representations and those representations for solving a particular task or addressing a particular task. Um, again, th this is used in combination with the loss so that you can build uh, better, better models as you train the models. <clears throat> I'm kind of losing my voice, so cope with me here, <laughs> but I'm enjoying this. Um, Okay, so deep learning algorithms are typically based on gradient descent. So we will learn about different gradient descents. You have the batch gradient descent, you have the HGD rise, stochastic gradient descent, mini, mini batch as well. So you know, in, in the early days, we have batch gradient descent, apply everything on all our data, but then eventually we had better ways to actually do this and do this faster, right? We needed to do it faster. And so now we have concepts like mini batch that are like kind of pop, really popular today. And we will learn the distinction between the three and also how to implement ourselves um, those ones, for instance, that you see on the right-hand side. So implementing you know, these algorithms are very, is a very important skill, right? Because um, there's always a new one that comes up that's you know, kind of dethroned the previous one. And you have all these like weird names, Adam, grad, Adam, EMS grad, Adam. You, if you look at this blog post um, from Sebastian, it has all like the, 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 even the recent ones are included but the ones that were used in the past as well, from a historical standpoint, you see all the ones that have been used over the years. So take a look at that uh, blog post, really, really interesting blog post that even has, I think it even has code on how to implement these things yourself. But again, we will learn it here and we'll have a discussion around that. <clears throat> um, so these are just the kinds of, of, of machine learning, like you have a supervised machine learning, you should be familiar with this. If not, there's so many blog posts that discusses these concepts, supervised learning, unsupervised learning. So clustering, right, PCA, representation learning, probabilistic graph graphical models, GANs, right, GANs, we will talk about GANs as well, pretty interesting for generative kind of models, right, so for building creative applications, GANs are really, really super cool. And I've seen like a lot of application from GANs also now moving into the space of natural language processing for generating languages. So very, very important um, concept as well over the years, this had kind of um, you know, people are like kind of slowing down on GANs, but still I think it's quite interesting to, to, to know about GANs. Um, and supervised ML, right? Supervised MLs are what has basically taken deep learning and has uh, created this rapid progress in different applications that use deep learning techniques. Because obviously these concepts here, I'll rely on, you know, supervised data sets, data sets that do have labels and these sort of things. Um, so you have your regression, your classification, search and ranking, recommender system, sequence learning, all of these things are gonna be discussed here. If you're interested in any one of those, um, we're gonna have discussions around that. And I really like that search and ranking and recommender systems is, 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 is a huge, also important part of the book. Um, I am very familiar with this space, like search, um, and, I, I, and I will introduce a couple of things that I have been wanting to introduce to you, like how to build you know, a scalable search application, something like that, or some component of search that you want to implement in your application. So that would be cool from a, I think, practical standpoint, that kind of knowledge I, I'm hoping to transfer over to you. Um, but you know, you have different, I've used PCAs before, PCA, right? Visible component analysis, I've used that before. I've also done clustering because I started with like data mining. So I have really good, I've actually applied it for research as well for really, really cool applications. 
Um, so I, I cannot wait to, to, to give you more examples on those and do some code watchers. Um, so that we have, now we start to see a lot of like focus on reinforcement learning. If you go to conferences these days, um, reinforcement learning has basically taken over uh, those conferences, machine learning conferences. And we start to see companies start to use it right a lot. And you know, it has been a really difficult, uh, has been something really difficult to master because they're not like really, like really great techniques. But for now, it's working for certain problems, and it's just keep keeps improving because there's so much investment in in this uh, area, and a lot of research is being conducted there, um, and a lot of students are getting more interested in it. So the more interest, of course, the more students join and do research around reinforcement learning. You start to see. Um, that it's making its way into like even spaces like NLP where you would think that you know this doesn't make any sense, but it, it is there um, and people are using it. So reinforcement learning, I like the concept because it basically generalizes everything about machine learning, right? It, 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 it's, a, it's a different it's a different framework, right? It's a framework that requires not only predictive models as we are used to seeing in deep learning, but also you know taking it a step forward where you have agents, intelligent agents that interact with our world, right? interact with an environment and somehow learn from this environment, learn about its environment and it just you know, keeps improving itself and it creates like these, um, <clears throat> it creates these agents that are of course really good at those tasks that it's training on. Uh, but that's, that's just, like I said, it's another step forward. I think, I believe in my opinion in deep learning and this is just, it just keeps being improved every day and yeah, that's also a very important discussion to have and how it's being, you know, how it's making its way into the other spaces like reinforced, like NLP, for instance. Uh, um, so this slide, I really like the, the, I don't know if you saw it in the in the chapter, for those of you that read it, there was like this, this really nice, it was like, I don't know when it was, but it was some, like some, like in the middle ages, I think they were trying to like estimate like the average foot length and they would use that information you know, I think to, I don't know what they were doing or what they were um, manufacturing, but I think that was really important for them. And you can see here a lot of people like measuring their feet land. Um, but that, that's cool to see, right? Even back in the days, we had this interest um, and this passion to estimate on things. And there have been a lot of different techniques that have been used over the years um, to, 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 to create predictive capabilities, to model data right, and, and to get insights from data. So like your distributions, all the different distributions there. Um, and at some point, right, with more data availability, basically statistics just took off. Like now we have methods that do really well at dimensionality reduction. We can visualize our data, all these different techniques that you know, have been introduced over the years. That's possible because obviously with more data, um, it's more representative and it's, it, it's more um, reliable as well. So theory of computation and information theory, both influence ML, I've sort of started to get really, really interested in these things as well, like on the theoretical side of deep learning, although a lot of people don't, it's not really discussed a lot, like in, 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 our, in, our, in our communities, but I think theory, right, having really um, well-grounded uh, theory for, for our methods and really sound theory um, for our methods, I think uh, it's, 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 these, these things are very important for our field, not only for our field, but you know, for a lot of the sciences. So I think that's also something to pay attention to if you're interested to do something like research in ML. Of course, a lot of influence from psychology and neuroscience. Um, I think that's why I ended up with machine learning because um, I really was mostly interested in, in, in human behavior. Most of my studies are around human behavior, like emotion analysis. And I always had a lot of interest for psychology and neuroscience in general, like studying the brain or something like that. Um, and now you start to see a lot, well, back in the days, well, there, there were more discussions around um, building you know, intelligent systems and, and trying to understand the brain and, and kind of create, use the brain as a blueprint to create some intelligent agent or something like that. Um, so all of that knowledge has basically influenced ML development as well. You could actually check it. Now, when people say, you know, is a neural, is a neural network the same as a, like, you know, like a physical brain or what's in your brain? Um, that's another topic to have, another discussion to have. But, you know, there's, there's some controversy around that as well. And people will tell you that, no, it's not the same. Um, so another like kind of debate also to have. 
So deep learning involves alternating linear and nonlinear transformation. That is what it's about. Is you have your linear layers, you have nonlinear transformations, and you have all these layers that you're just transforming your data, compressing your data, compacting your data, and you're not really losing information. You're basically you know, enriching your information along the way, all these different transformations. Um, and of course, you have kind of a, one of the key concepts in, in deep learning and why all of this even works, your backpropagation, of course, um, and you know we, we will learn how to implement backpropagation. I think if you're setting yourself to do like a machine learning engineer interview or something like that, you need to know backpropagation. <laughs> and, I, and I cannot emphasize this more. Backpropagation is really key and you need to learn how to implement it. And I will have uh, like a session and showing you how to implement it yourself. I think it's, it's really valuable to know this, even though maybe you're not really gonna implement it in the real world, but because we have so many different tools to do that, but uh, conceptually it's really good to understand it. Um, of course, that's what's used to adjust the parameters. I've been saying parameters of models or the models really gets well at doing well on a particular task. So that's what it is, right? This is just like, there's not even like a proper definition for deep learning. Actually, there's so many books, right? And the, at the end of the day, when you read the book, you're like, what is deep learning? It's just that, it's just like all these different like pieces of the puzzle that you put together and all these different transformations and all these different components that are coming up to just keep improving the way we transform our data and we represent our data. Okay, so road to deep learning. So, you know, we say that big data has a lot to do with it, cheaper computation, the other things as well as uh, things evolve. Of course, you, this is kind of the natural thing, right? Um, we keep improving our algorithms as well. And of course, algorithm has been something that the community has tried to spend more effort on. So creating better algorithms. Uh, no more do we you know, need to worry about big data or cheaper computation. It's getting cheaper, it's getting cheaper. I know still, you know, for a lot of us, it's, it's not affordable, but if you compare to what it was like um, a couple of years back, um, computation is getting cheaper, it definitely is. Um, but yeah, so more better algorithms as well will take us, um, will propel the, the field even further. So memory efficiency, you saw like, uh, this is more about the non-linearities. I will talk about non-linearities, just transformation that is applied to your data um, to create this kind of compressed forms or representations of your data so that your models are able to um, do well at the particular task. But I will get into those details later on. Um, I, don't, I won't have the time to actually talk on, in details about this today, but it's the concept of squashing. Just, take a, just do a search and you, and you look for it. You can, the book actually discusses a few points in chapter one but there's a lot of details around this as well um, that, that are coming up. So some key ideas that the dropout, for instance, right? So dropout for uh, regularizing, it's just a regularization technique um, that's, that's used for avoiding overfitting, but how do you apply it? When do you apply it? These are things that we'll discuss. Attention mechanism as well, memory networks, GANs, as I said, um, how to distribute your training as well, because sometimes, you know, you have massive data sets, how do you actually distribute this in parallel and take advantage of those things um, to, 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 to build your applications um, that maybe require a lot of uh, data processing. Uh, simulation in RL as well, those things will be discussed um, as well. And, and of course, deep learning frameworks, right? They play a key role, like I, like I said, it just made a lot of sense to have all these like modular frameworks that just, uh, people are just keep improving, keep improving, keeping adding things to it, keeping adding functionalities um, and all those new techniques, right? All those like uh, optimization algorithms are constantly being introduced into these frameworks. And, you know, you have the latest and greatest always. And, you, and that's so amazing because, um, you know, from research to the industry, somehow the, the gap is just like decreasing. There's the, the gap is really decreasing in terms of, um, applicability, right? All these things that we kind of research on and we implement and we put out there are, are easily being transferred over to these frameworks and you know, start to see a lot of, um, so this whole ecosystem, right? Of having all of these kind of things like these algorithms and these frameworks, um, they play a key role to make sure that um, deep learning is succeeding. So some other success stories, again, won't go into too much detail here, but you can read about each one of them, you know, in the book, there's some links as well, um, and a few examples, um, but I noticed the authors didn't really want to talk a lot about <laughs> the success stories, but there are a lot of success stories. You can read online, there's always a new one every day. Um, digital assistance, object recognition, right, for like self-driving cars or something like that. Uh, intelligent game playing agents, like you see on the right here, we have like a little GIF, uh, agent playing breakout. 
So you now we're from DeepMind. There's a lot of work there that they're doing in that space. Uh, robotics, logistics, computational biology. If you are from any one of these um, areas, you will definitely enjoy this study group. Uh, particle physics, you know, astronomy, uh, all over the place. MLS is becoming just a ubiquitous tool again for engineers and scientists. Uh, it's a good skill to have, even though maybe you don't aspire to be an ML researcher, an ML expert, it's always a good skill to have as a developer and it's highly recommended for you to, you know, to learn about it and how to apply it. <clears throat> so it's becoming more and more uh, usable in, in the world. And actually we still don't have like, people always ask me like, hey, do you know best practices on how to apply these techniques um, in the real world and so forth. We don't have best practices. We don't have policies around them. And we, we are working on that. There are different communities that are responsible for that. And they're creating policies. They're creating ways on how to better use these systems before we put them in the real world. So a very, very important discussion also to have um, and I cannot wait for when we do have those discussions and, and to hear your opinions as well. And, and just to hear, you know, where you're at and how you want to apply this and whether we can provide you some kind of assistance or we can give you some suggestions on how you, how to better apply it. Okay. So fairness, obviously racial, gender, age bias. I don't want to ignore this because this is a huge problem in our field and, and we need to address it, right? There's no running away from it, even though, we you know, mostly want to just focus on modeling. If you are developing a machine learning model and putting it in the real world, before you get into a lot of trouble, before people are start to criticize your application for certain things, these are the good things to know ahead of time before you even put something out there in the wild. Because <clears throat> there, like, again, there are some prejudices that, that, that are being represented by your models that shouldn't be out there. Okay, so what's next? So those are like a quick recap of the chapter. I hope I did a great job with that because I spent a lot of time creating the slides. I try to make them really nice and, and presentable. Obviously, I couldn't get into a lot of details, but all that stuff will come anyways. We will start to you know, talk about each one of those concepts. If at this point still it is not clear to you how actually to build a, a really a model from scratch, a very basic model, that's totally fine. These slides will actually be helpful for you for later on. And you know they can provide like a little, a really nice guide for you to look at special sections in the book and you know that, that that's why I kind of created the slide so hopefully it's it is useful for you um, and then session two will be preliminaries what is a preliminary so preliminaries are of course if you're going to every deep learning book there's always like you know probability statistics where what's the matter I need to know what are concepts I need to know before I jump into you know, starting to train models these are important to know you don't need to know everything and I will provide you the necessary content you know, at least uh, in the scope of this book, I will provide you what, what are the things that you need to know in these different areas of probability and so forth. Um, you know, expectation and variance, these different concepts. So if at this point it's not clear, don't worry about that. It's, we are just getting started with this. It's just an introduction. Um, and don't feel any kind of way if, if, you, if you feel like, um, you know, these things are intimidating at this point. It, it will be, it will come better. Um, I provide extra readings and additional exercises to practice. Uh, again, practice. I'm a huge advocate for this. I always try to practice anything that you learn, try to practice it. There's so many open tools out there that you can use, so many open code. You know, go into GitHub. I spend a lot of time on GitHub, by the way. Go into GitHub, try to, you know, use someone code. By the way, if you use someone code, always make sure that you give credit. I, I cannot stress this enough. If you're using someone code, you know, if it's open, provide a little bit of a credit for these people. These people are taking time, just like you, you're gonna spend time learning these things and maybe you wanna put it out there for people to use. You know, you would want people to actually credit your work. It, it, it was a problem in machine learning. I hope, you know, we can um, do better. And so I would strongly recommend you to, you know, practice those things. Uh, presentation plus code walkthrough. So I would always have like a couple of slides. It won't be as lengthy as this one. It will actually be less presentation and more code walkthrough and discussion. So that's what it's, it's gonna be about. And remember I said in between, we're gonna have special lectures. I'm gonna invite people to actually give lectures just as I've been doing in the in the NLP series talks. So we, we, we enjoy those, those are really great. Where I invite people to you know, talk about their tools and this and that. Um, it will be something pretty similar here, but I'll try to get some experts uh, just to teach us, uh, experts from the industry as well as from academia to teach us a little bit on how, you know, what things to keep in mind, how to actually uh, the best practices and how to actually apply these things in the real world. So I will announce the next day time on our GitHub repo and the Slack group. So please, if you haven't joined the Slack group, please, that's the place where I make announcements first. The GitHub repo will always have the most updated information. The Slack group is great because you can always ask your questions, anything that wasn't clear here. 
Um, you know, you can always ask it there. I'll try to do my best, even though I get a lot of messages every day, but I, tr I always try to answer everyone. Like if I haven't answered your, your question or your message, it's because, you know, I have so many messages I need to answer, but at some point I will answer it and I'll try to help you out, okay? Great, all right, so let's see. So I did promise that I was gonna do like a like a q and A. I'm gonna keep it short because I don't want to keep you longer. Because again, we wanted to keep it very basic today, um, just to have just to give you an idea on the things that are coming. Right, what I'm focusing on, where my mind is, where I wanna, you know, what's kind of my objective with this study group. I don't want it to be something that moves quick and people just get lost and they don't know, you know, they just waste their time. I don't want it to be like that. I want people to actually take the time, implement things, practice, and there's going to be a lot of exercises, enough exercises for you to actually practice, you know, while you wait for the next session. And those sessions, again, will be very heavy. Those will be sessions where I cover the concepts, you know, go through a few of the things that I found interesting in the book, as well as going through some code. Code will be a very important part of the, of the study sessions. And one thing I would say, at least from your end, I would ask you to you know, come prepared with questions, right? Jot down your questions. And you know, when the discussion session opens, I want you to also be able to share. I would really appreciate that. Um, I don't want to always be the one talking because I think I also want to learn from you as well. What are the issues you're facing? You know, what is confusing to you as well? You know, just, just to improve ourselves here and, and you know, learn from each other. Hopefully that's, that's the case. All right, so we had over, which is really amazing, by the way, I just want to share, we had over 100 people joining us today. Wow, that's, that's really amazing. I think that's the largest group um, of people I've, I've ever spoken to, but um, uh, I think a lot of people are interested in deep learning and they just want to learn it the right way. Um, and if it's so, you're in the right place. Um, I, could, I could tell you that. And we're going to try our best um, to give you some, some value and then for you to learn this stuff the right way. So let me see, I'll take some questions um, and then I'll try to answer them. And then, you know, uh, I'll, I'll let you go because uh, for some of you, it's actually really late. And then, you know, always feel free to ask me questions in the Slack group and I'll uh, try to address those. So we're not going to have the open discussion today, but in the second session, we're going to have an open discussion. People will be able to talk, bring your questions, come prepared and participate. Participation um, is strongly recommended. This is how you learn. This is how you learn to make mistakes and, and, and learn about things. Let's see. Oh man, so much, so much, so much sharing of information. I really love this. Really, really loving this. Um, this is the reason why I created this study group. I know that people want, want to share. And I think creating a platform like this allows people to share very easily. So great. A lot. Okay. Thanks, Carlos, for sharing the optimization gradient descent from Sebastian Reuter. Please take a look at that. It's really, really great and professional um, blog post. Okay, so let's see um, a lot of from Deep Learning AI, also some recommendations there for resources. Deep Learning that yeah, has really great courses as well. I actually recommended um, their, their, their deep learning specialization for you to get like a quick mm -hmm. overview of deep learning concepts. That would be really, really useful as well. Deep learning for coders, those are books, right? So Jeremy Howard also has uh, a few resources and with the Fast FBI initiative as well, there are a lot of things that you can take a look, right? If you're just wanna get knowledgeable about certain things and yeah. Fast FBI, really a lot of mention of Fast FBI uh, because they're, they have developed really amazing courses and it's always good to, to take a look at those and those are freely available, right? So let's see, any questions? I'm looking for questions. Okay, a lot of conversation around tooling as well, which is great. I see a lot of people have experience with PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, you know, PyTorch is actually pretty easy. Actually, if, as I show you more examples on how to use PyTorch, you will find it super, super easy, especially for the purposes of the study group. You'll find it um, quite easy to use. It's not that difficult, but again, I'll take baby steps and I'll, I'll show you how to Know, make the most out of it and, and how to use the documentation because the documentation has been for me like the best thing and that's where I would learn. Okay, so yeah, I will, so I'm gonna export the chat if that's what you're interested in. It's the, actually everything is recording, everything will be stored and I will um, provide the chat as a, maybe a text file, but I must, I don't feel so comfortable sharing the, the chat with the, you know, in open in the public. 
So if you're interested in it, maybe ping me on, on, on Slack and I will send it to you directly. I won't share it publicly. I think that's, that's not an okay thing to do, okay? Okay, so yeah, it will be available. The recording will be available. Okay. Yep. So Jax, so, okay. So I don't promise I will, I will use Jax throughout, but I will promise you, whoever, that there's going to be a session about Jax for sure, because I'm learning Jax also on the side. And you know, even if it's just to the, create a model from maybe applied transfer learning or something like that with Jax, I think that would be awesome to show, uh, just to talk about you know, how it compares with other uh, frameworks as well. So you know, keep an eye on that as well. That's definitely going to come at some point. And you know, if, you're, if you're just getting started with these deep learning frameworks, um, maybe this is a good place to start as well. And I, I don't know if there are books on it. That, people would recommend, but I'm sure there are a lot of examples online as well. So a lot of people mentioned Ajax and XLA. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, these tools are keep keep, keep getting better. Like every time I, I'm really impressed in how like fast these tools get developed and you know they are addressing really, really important things, right? Like they, they want to develop like faster uh, computation uh, libraries, which is great, not only for deep learning, but mm, other sciences as well. Right. <laughs> so I say is like I can't believe uh, I can't believe Elvis didn't even have a sip of water during the entire time he went through. So, you know, that's um, it, it's a good point. Actually, um, I'm really thirsty already. But the thing is, like, I'm so used to packing for hours in front of a you know of a camera because I actually training is my is my profession, right? I train people from all over the world, and I do this like every week, week in, week out. I'm so used to it. Although sometimes, you know, um, I, I lose my voice, but I'm passionate about this. I really want to help the community um, and, and I will spend time here trying to, trying to talk with you guys. Yep. Wow, so much, so much going on here. Yeah, I mean, if at this point you want to leave, that's totally fine. Okay, I'm just looking through the chat and see if I see any interesting question that I can talk about and I can address, or if I think I should keep it towards the end. Um, but yeah, you're free to leave. Thank you very much for joining us today. Again, we will have all those deeper discussions coming up. You know, I, this, this is going to be a lot of fun. I, I promise you it's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to learn something, um, you know, uh, may, maybe, maybe like it's going to take a while, but I wanted to design it this way because most of the things that I've seen, like I said, on, online, people are showing you like content and, and they're telling you, you need to learn this in three months and you can learn in three months. My opinion is in reality, now, based on my experience, these things take time. You know, I did I did a PhD and I applied machine learning and, and natural language processing. And I took a lot of time to equip myself with these skills. These skills are, don't come overnight. It takes a while. It takes a while to master these skills. I know, and with tooling, of course, with all these different tools, it, it just keeps been, getting better, I would say. But still, I think you know, there are some concepts in machine learning that you need to know about. There are some discussions like around bias and these things that we need to have. Uh, to properly apply it. So it takes time. It's not going to be something that we're going to rush. We're going to take our time and you're going to learn a lot. I can promise you. I can promise you that. Okay, so let's see some questions. There was a question here. How do we relate loss functions to metrics, say accuracy, precision? Yes, yes. So I have a specially designed, um, so I, I'm actually working on it. I was supposed to you know, make it public. So I have this like, um, like notebook that I prepared just to talk about how to measure precision, or ROC curves, how to actually create your own ROC curves um, from scratch. You don't need any tool to do it. Because again, if you, if you do, maybe you won't use it in industry. Maybe you don't really need it because there are so many tools that you can use to actually apply these things. Um, but I think developing them actually builds some intuition about them. And so that's why I wanted to create more of these. So definitely we will have a discussion around that, like accuracy, precision, again, last function is very important as well. Um, but you know how they compare and how you can use it um, to, to, to test the quality of your models. So that's, that's definitely going to come um, later on. At least a code watch I will do of this. Okay, so... All right, so more saving. Okay. Wow. Can we reproduce results of paper only using Colab? Um, so we have, I have implemented papers myself using Colab, uh, but older 
older methods, not newer methods. I think newer methods are more difficult because um, they do require a lot more resources. I don't know if one GPU is enough for, for, for newer methods today. Um, but you know, there are always like these like model reduction techniques that are coming up. I think those ones um, allow you to you know, maybe adopt some kind of model um, but smaller size, but still, you know, a, a good good performance still. So, um, yeah, maybe it's possible, but I think it's a difficult thing to achieve. What is the deep learning end-to-end -end pipeline? Yeah, what's the end-to-end -end pipeline, right? So, um, again, a, a discussion around deep learning as well as we start to implement things. Um, we will talk about it. We'll talk about what's the end-to-end. -end, you know, what are the important components. Um, and how you iterate faster for a deep learning, uh, deep learning model. Yeah. Okay. So some discussion around um, around uh, this is really interesting. Some discussion around uh, you know hardware requirements as well. So I don't promise you that I will have a discussion around hardware requirements. Although I think that's actually um, could be pretty useful, like having that discussion around um, you know. What, what are the requirements that I would need? Like for instance, uh, to, ex to maybe maybe implement a paper or something like that because someone asked before. Um, but that's much harder for me to actually you know, develop because I need to actually collect a lot of information and to you know, make that recommendation. I think there's very little resource for this online to be honest. Uh, but I think just at the, at the high level, maybe I could provide you some, some suggestions and places to look at and some requirements for say running a particular model or something like that. Um, but yeah, getting into those details is, is pretty, it was going to be a, a, a very difficult task for the hardware requirements. Yeah. But let's see, what I will try to do is try to find someone that um, is, is, is more familiar with this, like trying to you know, come up with the hardware specs that you need to develop something or, you know, something like that. And I'll try to do some research myself as well on this because I'm pretty interested in it. But yeah, I think there's some tools online as well that you can use to uh, figure out what are the hardware requirements if you are, say, running a task on a particular size of data or something like that. Yep, and using a particular model. All right, so can we include some of the seminal groundbreaking papers as suggested readings for each section chapter or something that makes sense to code up an experiment with? So again, if you're interested in the code implementation, we do have like, I'm going to get started with that soon. Like we do have like a, like a whole like group of people that are interested in paper implementation. If you, if you want to do that, um, I highly suggest you to take a look at the Slack group. There's a group of people that want to work on that and we will get started with that project if you're interested in it. Okay. But maybe here we won't, we probably won't have the time to actually implement a paper from scratch because there's so much content to cover first um, before we even jump into that. Yes, GPU versus CPU. Again, the hardware parts, right? Like how do they compare, right? So again, not an expert on that to be honest, but um, maybe I could put something together since that's highly requested already, or I can bring in someone to talk about it, but for sure, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, so how do, yeah, that's, that's, that's very important, right? And, and I get a lot of questions about this. Um, you know, how do I move my model from GPU to TPUs or something like that, right? I haven't seen a lot of content to be honest about this. And, and, and I, think, um, I think there's a lack of resources for this, to be honest, I haven't seen too much content on this, uh, but a few people are trying to, I know a few people that are trying to uh, develop some content to, um, to talk about this as well and how it compares. Yep. So a question, how could you give me, some, give me some pointers in the right direction in the field of NLP, given a set of sentences around a subject, how do I determine if they're one or more sentences that are generic and pretty much not directly related to the concept. So Ritesh, so I'm curious about this and, and I, I wanna ask you more questions about this, but um, I think the right, the right place to actually ask is just going to our Slack channel, asking the help channel, and I'll try to you know, give you some suggestions there. That's what I typically do for people that are you know, getting started with NLP. So I'll typically just give some recommendations there and provide some advice, but now join the Slack channel and ask your question there and then we can interact some more. Yeah, we have informed, so we don't have a, a computer vision group per se, but I'm highly encouraging and, and, and people to, to, to do more, you know, computer vision uh, paper reading. So in the, I think we have done maybe two or three papers related to computer vision, which were a lot of fun. 
I'm not an expert in computer vision. I'm mostly, I'm mostly um, centered around NLP research, but I've been learning a lot from, 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 you know, from computer vision through paper readings. So I think it's really great to, to learn stuff there. Um, so yeah, we, we, we were definitely gonna mix it up and you would have, um, you'd have the opportunity to learn some things there. So the question is, could we solve some research papers in the group? That, that's the same question as before. Um, I, so Rahul, I have, like I said, another group of people that are, we are gonna start work on that. If you're interested, just go into the group and, and, and ask around and we will lead you to the, to the right place. You can check the GitHub. There's a conversation around that as well. So the first paper we're gonna implement is the word to vec right? So word to vec paper. I think that's a great start for those of you that you know, are interested in NLP. And that's the first paper that I selected. Um, so I'm strategically selecting these papers and we can implement them and we can definitely implement that um, pretty easily. I've done it in the past, so definitely gonna use that experience. So, okay, let's see. So any chance we play with hugging face during the NLP portion? That's a great suggestion. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I will, that some of you actually mentioned to me that I should make a record of this chat because I think that's great. So the, so the hugging face, I've used hugging face in the past. I've actually done some notebooks and some tutorials around hugging face. Um, I think for NLP it makes a lot of sense. I mean, this, this library is quite popular these days. Um, and they, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm very like, um, the, very close with them as well. Those people from Hug and Face and interact with them a lot. Um, and so definitely, I think we will do something related to Hug and Face for NLP at least. So that's coming as well. And I, of, of course, I already have a lot of materials so I could maybe reuse those things. Okay, so let's see. So where's the group? Uh, let's see, Joe, let's see, let me, let's see how I can find this. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for now. Let's see. I'm gonna share. Okay, and one, I think those will be the questions. Um, thank you so much for joining today. And I'm, I'm really excited, like I said, there's a lot of people that are gonna help me with this and that's just gonna be me. Um, you know, I, I promise that I'll try to give you the best of what I know, okay? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not like an expert in computer division, for instance, but I know I know something and I know a little bit to apply it. Um, I'm more like more, re, more concentrated on NLP research um, and I also apply these models as well. And, you know, I will use that knowledge to transfer it over to you. It's deep learning. That's the stuff that we're applying, um, you know, and, and, and I'll try my best to do so and, and just keep those sessions as informative and valuable for you. Um, you know, if you if you have some feedback to give me, also I welcome those. I always want to try to improve myself as well. And if there's something missing that you think we should add, right? All the suggestions that I got today, just just send them over. I'm I'm more very open to to. I'm very flexible. I've always done that, adapted um, to, to 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 your needs. So please let me know that that feedback is going to be really tremendously useful for me. So I really appreciate that. Okay, so let me just share the. Slack group, that's the Slack group here. It's also in the slides. I'm gonna share the slides later in the GitHub uh, repo, but that's the, for those of you that are interested, that's the Slack group. So join us there and ask your questions. People are interacting a lot there. Yep. You're welcome, you're welcome. Um, I'm very passionate about this. I do this a lot. I see there's a need to do this kind of efforts in the community. Um, and my thing is, like I said, I, um, I wanna make sure that this stuff is taught the right way. This stuff requires a lot of time. I have to be really honest with you, you know, and, and, and I wanna make sure that uh, if I spend time doing this, that something gets transferred to you and that you learn something and that's something that's valuable and that you can use as well. So that's why I'm emphasizing on best practices and how to you know, apply these things. Yep. Thanks everyone. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it um, and I will see you Maybe in two weeks I'll see you again, and we're gonna have a blast because we're gonna, you know, start to get into the hands and stuff. So a, a word on TA. If you, I didn't mention that, but I should have mentioned it at the beginning. If you are interested to, you know, help me out with, you know, grading stuff and 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 also maybe even delivering something or doing a code walkthrough and help me out with that, I would really appreciate that because I have other projects as well that I'm working on um, besides this one. If you're if you're interested in that and you want to push yourself, I can help you out as well. Like, you know, 
um, kind of guide you as well and, 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 and just advise you on know, how you better can deliver stuff. If you want to practice, use this platform to practice. I, I think, you know, I'm sure that you will learn how to become a better presenter, something like that. Um, so yeah, let me know, let me know. Just, just, just interact with me in, in the Slack group or on Twitter. And if you're interested, I'll, I'll be happy to, to take you on. And um, yeah, and so you, you can help me out with it here, definitely. You're welcome everyone, so thank you. Thank you, bye.